Hey, what is up everyone? It's Rich. All right, welcome to the video. So, um, as a celebration of 15,000 subs on YouTube, one of the things that I was going to do was I was going to unlock um, a week's worth of Patreon content for everyone. Uh, I started playing around with the numbers and I was like, 15,000 subs, let's do 15 videos. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to shoot eight patreon style videos for youtube that are brand new that will be shared with both patreon and youtube and then um unlock seven of uh patreon picked uh favorites uh, videos so what i did is i just basically asked everyone on patreon i said hey what's a video that you love that i did that's just on patreon um maybe a video that you either learned a lot from or that you've returned to many times and checked it out and so they're recommending things i'm going to kind of push them on that again today but uh one of the prog projects that we're doing right now is we're going through the wizard um how to draw a comic book like store storytelling um book that wizard did the basic training so collects all the basic training um uh, articles that they did and they're fantastic books i ordered the full set um and uh we've been going through it so it's really really interesting we're you know 20 or 25 pages into it. this would be the fourth video that i've done but we're getting an advanced layout which isn't bad you know sometimes it's good people have talked about on the patreon that it's like even if they're a beginner there's an interest in seeing what advanced level co content uh, looks like because it it sort of gives you a bar to shoot for um and uh then one interesting comment that uh russ made on my Instagram yesterday, which I really appreciate, and I thought it was a pr pretty profound comment, is they actually enjoy learning with me. So when, when I do videos like this, I may know some of the information, but I do it as a learning process for myself as well. And there's something, there's there's a, a level of interest in that. And, and the thing is, is I think that there's a, a sense of community with that, meaning that we're all kind of learning together and everybody's in a weird way on the same page, but we're all gonna have different, um, things that we've already developed so maybe you know you know who knows like one one person may draw girls better than another person or one person might really truly be a beginner and is is kind of working on everything but anyway let's get into this enough of the blah 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 and uh let's check this out i've not read ahead um and uh, we're gonna see what's going on here so um and i do i read all the content we discuss it i would love to see some discussions in the comment section so Feel free to participate. That's what it's all about. So the way an artist lays out a page can make or break a story. I 100% agree with that. And storytelling is so personal. No matter how well uh, a story is written, so whether the readers realize it or not, layout and sequencing play a huge part in shaping a comic. That is so true. Artists sometimes, I think, are undervalued in this process. Um, I've mentioned on YouTube how many times I watch videos of, of what I would consider pure fans. They're not artists. They don't really have a dog in the fight. They'll do a comic book review and literally never mention the artist. They only talk about the writer. They only refer to the writer. You would honestly think hearing the review that the writer actually drew the comic book. And I, as an artist, I do find that a little bit um, strange and you know potentially unnerving. All right, so readability is key in panel layout. Breaking out of a standard nine panel layout may help keep the layout fresh and engaging, but straying too far from the standard left to right, top to bottom layouts can confuse readers and take them out of the story. Utilizing panels in terms of focus, size, I stress size all the time, and number can also add to or detract from storytelling. Uh, concepts like those are just the tip of the iceberg. So with so many choices, here are a few tips from the pros to suck a reader right into your scene. So we've got, um, I'm assuming this is Gary Frank. Um, I'm not sure what Libra's first name is. Doug Mankey and maybe Terry Moore. I don't know. It's, I feel like I missed something there. For some reason, I thought that, that something that we were looking at was going to be Frank Miller, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, to thumbnail. I use lots, oh, Steve Lieber. Uh, I use lots and lots of tiny little thumbnails. I do them about the size of two postage stamps, so two inches tall. That is a very, very small thumbnail. That, that's literally a, a, a thumbnail. <laughs> I like to make my mistakes small in a form where there are no consequences. I think most of the important thinking in a comics development 
happens at the thumbnail stage. You want to be free to brainstorm and reject some ideas. Look and see if you're doing something you've done before and erase it. If I was to just dive in on the page, the first thing I would go to would probably be something that I've done before because I know it works and it's safe and it's fast and it's easy. Whereas if I'm working off of tiny little thumbnails, I can push myself harder to try something that I haven't come up with yet uh, with before. Uh, yesterday I was laying out um, some Blaster Kid stuff and uh, I had had an idea for a promo like cover piece for a while and in my mind I had it pretty clearly visualized. What I found is when I put it on the paper it didn't really have the impact that I wanted. I felt like the way that the scene was directed and what the focus was put you in a weird spot especially for a cover the focus was really really in a bad spot um, but it's still a very dynamic piece so I, I played with it literally for about two hours but I was doing thumbnails but mine were um, I took 11 by 17 um, piece of paper and I divided it into four and I was working with that N nothing was overly ruled out and I just I played with shapes I played with overlapping shapes um, and really, really started to get some stuff that looked cool. But again, it, it ended up not being something that I felt worked as a, especially a main cover. So, you know, the nice thing was, is I wasn't dedicating a ton of time to each one. I could knock them out in a few minutes and, um, you know, I'll show all that stuff uh, as we move along and you guys can check it out. I think it'll be fun for people. And, um, uh, Ultimately, I'm still sort of trying to concept a few different cover cover ideas, covers and you know like promo pieces, just exciting stuff. Generally speaking, the storytelling is actually easy for easier for me because you get to play with more things in the, in the frame. So, all right, let's continue. Freeze frame to figure out a complex scene of U.S. Marshal Carrie Stetko's battle against hypothermia in Whiteout Two. Steve Lieber maps out the action with thumbnails. Uh, I let me see something here. I just want to see if we have the thumbnails on another page. That's more the advanced layout. Okay, let's just continue with this. Um, I guess they're just showing an example of finished page. This is very very nice. I mean, honestly, at this size, it does really feel like something Frank Miller would do. It's got a little bit of like an Electro Lives Again thing. Um. Narrow panels that are all the same size, you'll move through quickly. I don't know if you noticed it when you looked at these, but this is a fairly fast sequence, even though the sense of space here, this feels like it takes more time. Like they're walking, there's a lot of time involved in this panel, but then ultimately they crash down. Um, but I don't know, this moved quite quickly to me. And this is really nice. This is a nicely laid out page. The the actual just compositionally, it sweeps you across like this really good. But this dark area pulls you here. This sign pulls you this way. This shape pulls you back around. The white is kind of pointing you here. And you have this nice little four panel inset that all has really pretty shapes. If you look, it goes like this. Do you see that? This. And then he leads you which way? He's taking you up and out. Um, or not thumbnail. All right, here we go. This is Gary Frank. Wow, so Gary Frank doesn't use thumbnails? That's crazy. All right, let's see what he says. So I don't use thumbnails. I'm pretty low tech and use a regular H pencil. These were these were interviews that were done in probably the 90s, I want to say. It says 2004 it was reprinted. I'm not sure when this original interview was done. Frank's process may be different now. I don't know, but... Um, Probably not, because he had been working at least for 10 years, I would say, at this point professionally. So I'm pretty low tech and use a regular H pencil. I don't use rulers or anything. I just kind of sketch it onto the board. I've seen Jim Lee does this. I believe Mark Silvestri works this way. Um, Travis worked this way. Uh, it's all pretty fluid at that stage. I push panels around and mess around with panels if they don't seem to be working, but it's very seldom that you'll need to start a page over again simply, be, simply because you're not putting down anything hard enough that it can't be changed at that stage. So, key, draw very lightly. Don't start refining things. The first thing that you need to do is you need to get in the position of things, the shape that you're going to use, how much real estate... There should be no detail on that part of the drawing. You're just placing in the objects. It would be like um, I unplugged my tablet. 
You know what I mean? He's just, he probably roughed in like an outline of Captain America in Namor and just, that's the size relationship he had in the script, you know, the reaction of Namor in three panels and then did this. Next, you would start to put in the forms. Um, sometimes what I'll do is sketch out three pages at once. I think that's a really smart idea, um, but I won't just, I, I, but I won't jump ahead in the book. The problem with that approach, as I found early on in my career, is that you tend to draw the pages that you want to draw, and then you kind of have a mental block with the rest, because on later pages, you're doing the stuff that you put off, the stuff that you didn't really want to do. It's an interesting take. I think when I read the three pages at once is is that you'll have a nice flow. Like if you lay out scenes and maybe draw scenes, I don't see any reason if you're a penciler, unless you were on some sort of deadline scenario, that you would um, not work in order. And then also, uh, it would just... I know sometimes writers provide script in very bizarre ways, but most, I think, people now are starting to lean more towards writing and drawing their own books. But yeah, I would work in order, and uh, you definitely will need a sense of discipline with things. But yeah, absolutely. Um, I work from hard to easy always, believe it or not. Um, n not necessarily with Blaster Kid, but what I mean is um, if I'm inking someone and they send me eight pages of art, I will always grab the hardest pages and the pages that I kind of don't want to do first. And if there's a super easy page, that's always the last page that I'm going to do. Cause, or, or something that looks really, really fun. If it looks super fun, I, I save it till the end because you, you're going you're gonna to have an energy tank. And you want to make sure that you save. <laughs> if you're not going to have energy at the end of the job, you're going to do something so fun, it's going to boost your energy. I call it art cardio. Um, <laughs> shake things up. Gary Frank doesn't like to use thumbnails, so well-crafted gags like Namor's rejection of Cap's membership proposal in Avengers 7, um, or 61, sorry, uh, flow... Why did I say Avengers 7? Oh, that's weird. Did I add the numbers? Uh, flow directly onto his drawing board. It's crazy, you know? Kudos to you, Mr. Mr. Frank. That's really cool. And he, Gary just got better and better and better. I honestly think that he's doing probably the best work of his career now. Oh, gosh, sorry. Um, all right, so let's get to this one. This looks interesting. Different styles, too. Advanced layout. Uh, I was, I was going to try to read the word balloon. It's a little pixelated to actually... Um, read this although i do see the, t the text no sex for a while choosing the right number for the number of panels on a page more often than not it's determined by the script maybe not now though if we're writing our own books i will occasionally add a panel or two if i think that a good pause is uh, uh if i think that a pause is good in a scene I'll add a silent panel if I'm working with someone like Greg Rucka, who encourages me to play with these things. I'll sit down with him to work out certain scenes. On one occasion, I took a page from five panels to 16 panels, and we worked that out very carefully. That's interesting. So he must have read the script and really felt that there was a moment where he could um, do a ton of panels. Unfortunately, this isn't the example. Pause and effect. Steve Lieber uses a silent panel, panel five, uh, this panel right here, um, before she enters a place she doesn't really want to be in. Whiteout number one. Dude, Steve Lieber is a really, really fantastic artist, and I have not seen much of his work, but this is great-looking drawings. He's really, really good. I'm like, I need to see some Steve. I've heard his name for years. I always thought he was a writer for some odd reason. Uh, maybe I have seen his comic work, and I just don't, I'm not putting it together. Uh, story yelling. Sometimes everything on the page is built around, say, three girls standing there talking. I'll give them a full-length panel that'll run top to bottom, that will run top to bottom, and build the other dialogue around that. The opposite of that would be, for instance, in Strangers in Paradise, where one of the guys is in the middle of an argument with Kachu, uh, and he pays her a compliment. I wanted to show several panels in a row where her whole demeanor changes... Uh, so I went with little squares and just showed her face changing over three or four panels. And this is nice, you know. Um, if I'm just looking at this visually, I mean, he definitely looks like he's the aggressor here. He's above her. There's this kind of black sort of thing. I mean, it really, you get the impression that he's looming over her. And, uh, she, you know, obviously her gesture is sort of that she's 
standing up to him, but he continues, you know, the face sense thing, and then this is nice. So it reminds me of maybe like something that you would see in like a, 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 ma a manga style book. Uh, okay, so, um, the old switcheroo. Strangers in Paradise, Kachu receives a compliment in the middle of a co-worker's tirade. Oh, and it changes her whole perception of the conversation. I get it. I get it. That's, that's the switcheroo right here. Uh, word balloons. I don't pencil in any word balloons. This is Doug Mankey. Uh, estimating how much room you have is, uh, wait, hold on. I don't pencil in any balloons. Uh, is really something that you gain from experience and it gets easier as you go along. Let's say you have a really wordy panel and an artist is going to shoot himself in the foot by filling it with lush and beautiful backgrounds and endless detail, only to find that it all gets covered up by word balloons. I certainly work out panel breakdowns if I have a real complicated series of word balloons that have to be connected or overlap just to make sure. So hopefully, uh, if you are working with a writer, not only the per providing you script in terms of description of what you're going to draw but actually the dialogue most i think do now although you know we've all heard of the marvel style which is you basically get kind of a summary of the story it could be one or two pages of of like hey you know we have a big fight scene between this character and this character and everything is on fire and then so and so shows up but uh, they don't really tell you but but it, because the dialogue i think is written afterwards then then um in a weird way, the artist does actually control that because if there's not much room, then you obviously wouldn't have a ton of dialogue. Uh, the last word. Doug Mankey might only pencil in figures as in this panel to the left from The Mask Strikes Back if the panel will be uh, overrun with word balloons. So he only penciled in the figures. There's no background and stuff like that. And that is a lot of dialogue for a small panel like that. So, all right. Let's continue if you have any questions or if you have any, um, I have the Will Eisner storytelling book too. And also those shop talk. It was, the, there was a book that was released called shop talk. Uh, I just want to make sure I don't go out of order. 23. Okay. First things first, read the script. Basically, just give it a quick read-through on a page-by-page -page basis. I look to see how many panels there are per page. Then I read through it again and try to work out which panel is going to need the big, to be the big impact shot. If there's going to be an impact shot on any of the panels, then work around that. If there's a particular image, something that's particularly striking about that page, then I'm kind of mentally allocating extra space for that and trying to find a way to move around the other smaller panels and less important things around. Here's an extra thing that I'm gonna advise people, and this was a big revelation to me, is I penciled my heavy metal story. Um, that I, I, I penciled it and inked it. Um, what I found when I was laying out pages is when you start to get something that's looking good, it doesn't necessarily have to be the biggest impact shot. I get what he's saying. When he's sketching stuff out, he's giving a certain amount of space to things. But beyond that, as you start to draw things, if you have this and this works really, really well, but you haven't figured out this shot yet, this you can keep because it works and it looks good and you've got this cool lighting then you build the layout this this is helping you decide compositionally what you're going to do here you know you're not going to want to have directional things that conflict with it he's got this beautiful piece of lightning that comes right in here this comes into here he pulls you up here so that you see this the blast really lets you feel the impact of this and this is i've um giving lessons to someone and they wanted to learn how to do fight scenes and a lot of what you have in fight scenes is what i was calling like contraction and then expansion um this is like like this is expanding do you see this shape as a big v shape and then things will be closed off and when you rotate that things are closed off things are opened up you get this uh, very um blasty feeling to the art um and he really really captured it here it's more closed off and then this just ignites and the speed lines and this big cone shape just sends you up here and the character you can literally feel the force just from being pushed up here by the shapes and it knocks him back 
our eye movement knocks this guy's back this guy back just as much as the drawing did and then you kind of come back down here and you enjoy this figure gesturing at him so it's a nice layout just based on that also uh, Gary Frank will shrink panels to free up more room for the impact shot as with this Hyperion versus Dr. Spectrum slugfest and Supreme Powers number eight so there you go and it works great you know I can't imagine having these panels any bigger in a, in a page like this anyway though I think that 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 just critically thinking about it like I, I wouldn't want more space. But I guess you could have three equal size panels. Like you could have done like widescreen, widescreen, widescreen kind of deal. So maybe maybe I, I take that back. Scene shifts. I start with what I think of as the first scene. I think of my book as having three, four, five scenes in it, like a TV show. I have a setup interior. Then I have a setup outside. Then I have a setup uh, on location somewhere. Sometimes when I get halfway through the book or near the end, I start rearranging scenes, or I may take the pages and interlace them so that as you read it, you're bouncing around more. It's kind of like being an editor for a TV show. Drawing those pages is just like shooting it with a camera. And that's, you know, uh, I'm going to say that Terry Moore writes his book too. So that gives him the freedom to play with the directing that way, where it's not only... Um, the, the that he's drawing it but he's orchestrating it so if you write and draw your own book or you have a good relationship with your writer you can recommend things like that like hey what if we cut back and forth between like um you know the one character is out on the streets but but stuff is still happening at home can we bounce back and forth between those two setups uh, chop chop quick scene cuts like the jump from kachu's bedroom to francine getting on the bus and strangers in paradise number five will speed up your pacing so this i guess speeds up the pacing it's i don't feel it that much on this honestly but i get what they're saying it's you know half the panel is her at home with a polaroid i don't know what's going on and then this is someone gets on a bus okay and repetition equals boring and this is Doug Mankey. All right, I've grown to really like either doing very narrow panels or very wide panels as a rule in my own stuff. If I can do something that's tall and narrow, I'll do it if it can fit enough information. But if you've got a lot of people speaking or multiple layers of conversation in a single panel, obviously that doesn't work too well. The biggest thing that I focus on is not being repetitive as you turn the page. I don't like to have the same structural layout on one page next to, the, uh, to another. Um, and then there's an example where it says, Mankey puts the masochistic, masochistic hitman Walter on a diet with a series of taller vertical panels. And I agree with that. I, in my heavy metal stories, another example, I was very, very conscious to keep all the layouts of the pages kind of unique to their own thing. And it, definitely if I would have caught myself doing something overly re re repetitive, I probably would have shut it down. But... but there are times where that's a very, very effective storytelling thing. If you want to make sure that they always feel like like when someone is being yelled at in an office and you cut away from it and then you come back to it and you want to continue this person getting beat down maybe by their boss. I don't know why everyone always uses the boss and the <laughs> the employee getting like yelled at in the office, but <laughs> it seems to work. But you know what I mean? Like, like you could keep that repetitive because it also is kind of brutal for the reader. It's like, oh man, is like the boss ever going to let this guy go? So do you see the psychology that you're using there? You're, you're not only um, making it visually rep repetitive, but it does sort of play in with the actual sort of story thing that's going along. Um, and uh, the other thing I was going to add is if you have two pages next to each other, meaning that like when you open your comic, you want to be aware of, of the, I think it's called co co coalition. Um, but you know, like, like know what the first page of your book is going to be. Is it going to be like, if you open the comic, the first page is going to be, um, credits with no art. And then you're going to open it up to a two page spread. And that two page spread is going to be the opening two pages of your book. Or is the first page of the book when you open the comic on the right side actually going to be uh part of your story because that's going to affect what pages are facing each other the whole time you draw your story um i remember greg capullo getting very very upset at the ad placement that dc was using in his it might have been court of owls and he was very vocal about it online and um i don't remember if he was apologizing to the fans or more just voicing his frustrations about it but uh 
he said he said he saw the comic book and was just in shock because it, there were so many ads it was breaking up the storytelling and i think ultimately a few months later dc actually listened to greg's um concerns and started putting all the ads in the back of the book if i'm not mistaken i could be wrong on that but i i kind of remember that um but you know obviously if you're doing a creator own book like i'm doing with blaster kid all i need to be aware of is what pages are going to be facing each other on pages two and three and four and five and five and six and and you definitely don't want to make those panels repetitive either unless it's intentional you know what i mean and you don't want weird tangents either meaning that um uh like something that you drew on this page the page next to it it starts to create weird shapes or ugly storytelling we'll get into that later i can do other examples but let's continue with the book i don't like to sidebar too hard on these but uh people seem to enjoy the um the actual so i guess i saved this one twice yeah, let me show this. uh splash pages splash page okay so oh did i do that twice too no 25 sucks some of the page numbers 23 okay i think this is the order it's gonna all right so i guess that was the end of the storytelling for now again these were short three page articles uh that they would have in wizard magazine but there, you know there's a lot of gems of wisdom greg capullo um did a, a whole series of them that were really really cool and uh i'm sure most people that experienced them at the time really appreciated it because it was so rare to have someone at capullo's level although people had done the the column before but uh you know it's it's like you're having like a, someone that's not only incredible as an artist but re really knew what they were talking about and could explain it mignola did a real good one on uh i think creepy environments uh so anyway so show them where you live when i was a kid playing baseball in little league what we yell out to a teammate batting at the plate show them where you live <laughs> it meant hit a home run it was challenging it was a challenge wrapped up in encouragement i like that i've never met jim califiore i i was actually a fan of this guy's stuff when i first started collecting i don't know uh if he still works like on a regular basis but uh, that's funny i like that a lot show him where you live challenge wrapped up in encouragement all right so just like each chance to draw a splash page i'm telling you i find splash pages and covers so much harder to draw than sequential pages because they really you have to show them where you live whenever i get a new plot and i'm going over this the splash page i feel like the writer is saying show them where you live it's my opportunity to knock it out of the park which could be why i like get hung up on them is because i really want to do something outstanding uh which is why i start to look for a place to hide when uh sometimes hit a dribbler to third <laughs> everyone does it from time to time but it's not a good thing so let's look at how i try to avoid that oh this is going to be great and he's funny he's got a i mean that's a lot of personality for an intro i already like this guy stepping up to the plate there's often more than one chance in an issue for a home run but what we're examining here is the opening splash page which again would be page one the, the um that you know right when you open the comic the knock you on your saw so i'll knock you out of your shoes thing usually on page one it can be the most important page and more than just a money shot it sets the tone of the story ideally it grabs the reader and propels him or her into the rest of the issue and from a strictly mercenary point of view it can determine a sale to the browsing customer if the splash page doesn't grab them back in the rack it goes first impressions can be everything dude that is so true i used to talk about it a tiny bit more in my old videos but how i would decide i i've mentioned this before when i go to the comic book store i look through every single new book that comes out if they have a new book section or they mark the new books i'll flip through every single one and it's a law of averages if i see enough pages in a comic that look interesting to me or are exceptionally well drawn usually it's more interesting it's not so much that someone is a virtuosic uh, level penciler it's like do i flip through it and go it's kind of a trippy page this person's got a weird style wow the colors are really weird this is like like i'm gonna get some replay value out of this if there's a certain percentage of pages if a comic book has enough of those pages that make me curious or or like blow me away i'll buy it if not it goes back on the rack just like he says all right so here's our scenario an action shot the hulk and daredevil are in a mid battle on a new york city street devastation is all around the hulk is pounding the pavement with a powerhouse blow that old horn head has just leapt clear of 
uh, pro tips, take a stand. A person's posture can tell us his age, social status, vocation, even what he's thinking. Concentrate on the spine, the shoulders, and the bend of the knee. Rags Morales, identity crisis. Um, the other thing that I'll say too is that I mentioned this uh, in reference to Venom the other day. Uh, it might have been a Patreon video. Like, like Venom should never really be like straight up and down. Like, even if you're doing a sketch of Venom and it's going to be like a bus shot. It's not a school portrait of Venom. That's like literally so out of character for that character. You want to have his shoulders looming over him, his head kind of in the middle of his his collarbones, and you know, turn the camera so that it's an off kilter shot. It should be terrifying. You know, he's not getting his fifth grade photo taken to so that his grandma will put it in her purse. Um, all right, the swing. My first step in working out an image is a series of small sketches called thumbnails. They're very rough. The character is barely more than stick figures, but it's the best way to run through ideas quickly. And again, you don't get married to it. You haven't devoted a, a lot of time to it. And um, you, you wouldn't be scared to erase this. Like if you drew this, you're not going to go, ah, oh, shit, I could never get that back. So I better not erase this because this is you know, uh, something that I could never do. And the great thing with, with Photoshop or Clip Studio is you could actually just have tons of layers or however you want to do it, you know, different, uh, you know, you could use it as tracing paper, you could use it as cut and paste, whatever. So uh, most of these artists probably at this time weren't working with um, either Photoshop or Clip Studio. The first two are similar. In both, I'm using the perspective lines of the building to focus the eye. You see here, this is, I guess, three-point perspective. Yeah. Uh, bu -bu 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 I was looking at my, okay. Um, figure A is looking down at the combatants in a crater of destruction, while figure B is at ground level looking on from one end of a trail of destruction. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. I was looking literally for a labeling of, like, figure A. I thought maybe someone was flying into this scene, and then on this scene, uh, someone was viewing it or something. Uh, all right, so... Figure A is looking down at the combatants in a crater of destruction, while figure B is at ground level. And they would maybe consider this a worm's eye view. Um... And I guess this bird's eye. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. The perspective gives a nice feel, but both suffer from the same foreshore company. I was thinking the same exact thing he was going to say. The characters are too far away from us. Uh, on a splash, unless there's a plot reason against it, I want to be close to the action. This is exactly one of the problems that I had with that blaster kid sort of promo thing that I was doing. Is She was just too far away. The setting was beautiful. It was a really, really epic and kind of haunting shot just didn't have the the oomph she's too far away she's the main character you gotta people want to see her they want to be up close and personal uh which is it i'm gonna assume this is the next page all right so the follow-through the next idea figure c is fine but that's all it is Everything is there, Hulk, Daredevil, the city in the background, etc. But I didn't do anything interesting with it. I'll often have an okay idea, which I'll take a second look at, a typo, uh, and think about rotating the camera for more interesting positions. And, you know, look, this is a nice shot. He needs to pull the camera in even more. This is still too... I'm not in the action. It's It serves the purpose. It's a fine drawing. I want to be like... I mean, if you took this exact shot... I want to be like, whoa, sorry, my phone beeped too. I, I want to be like in it, you know, and uh, you might even want to turn the camera a little bit and just have it like, you know, you could have something like this and this is going to be an exciting shot. I put it right about here and maybe even fan out the perspective a little more. So figure D, um, let's see. This is better. I'm liking this quite a bit more. Uh, figure D is better. Moving the camera around to behind Daredevil now has the Hulk coming more towards us, involving us in the action. I totally agree. Uh, yeah, you know, there is a person... That that was a problem with this, too, is that, that no one was really facing us. So we still felt like a third party sort of just viewing something. It had a very, um, like, uh, it, it just felt too distant. But psychologically, it felt too distant, too. This, you're like, shit, 
Hulk's gonna kick Daredevil's ass, and then he's coming for me. That's exciting. Uh, so uh, the only problem here is the Daredevils I'm facing us. I agree with that too. Um, I want both characters facing us, and that's a hard thing to do in a fight scene. You're like, shit, I gotta have both characters facing me, but they're fighting. Wouldn't they be facing each other? Which now I'm behind them. Uh, so I played with the Daredevil figure separately. Really, really smart. Uh, I used the old facing us, but not facing us dodge. Twisting the figure by turning Daredevil's torso mostly towards us. Then turning his head to look back at the Hulk, keeping his face at least in profile. This guy is awesome, man. I'm Jim Calafiore won me over again. Like I said, I remember being a fan of his stuff way back. Yeah, this they're cool. I like um, not well any of these finished and nicely drawn would look cool. I think. This is pretty badass. Um, this is a nice pose, but I think this is a little better. And then this is pretty cool, too. Although this, it doesn't look like he's getting beat up as much. Although, we'll see what he does with it. I'm curious. I also wanted to tweak the Hulk a bit. His motion in the thumbnail is down and to the left and away from Daredevil. I'll scroll back up and look at it again. Uh, to have him going at Daredevil, I just flopped the figure. But I still wasn't happy with the pose. I pushed it further to more... Uh, to put more oomph in the blow. Uh, look at figure G. He's really jackhammering the street now, all of which led to the next step. Okay, so let's look at this. Okay. Yeah, and then what's interesting is, do you see the shape right here that this creates? This doesn't focus us really the way that we want to go. We want to move through this piece and really, um, you know, the focus is going to be here, but this frames things in a weird way. And this is going to, what this is going to do is he's going to create a circular shape between the Hulk and Daredevil. Daredevil will somehow create a loop with him, I bet. That way you keep looking at the two of them. You'll keep swinging back and forth between the two. Um, and again, this is a nice drawing. There's nothing wrong with this drawing at all. I love his thighs. The arm is good. This hand is cool. All of this is win. Really, really good forearm. This is great. And he even turned the... Um, uh, tricep we're getting to enjoy here I'm learning the names of the muscles better <laughs> I finally decided it's like I need to learn it and actually remember it. wow okay this is crazy did he really oh I guess these are just the layouts interesting I wonder which one he goes with uh, figure H is larger more detailed sketch putting it all together but why isn't it finished you ask well, at this point, I realized it wasn't working. Remember I said that the first splash should propel the reader through the rest of the book? Well, I now have a more interesting angle. There just isn't enough excitement. That's the point of this process, to find what doesn't work as well and what does. Oh, well, back to the drawing board, literally. Wow, this dude's a beast. I'd be, I would be tapping out at this point and going like, this is good, just... But I explained to someone that's taking lessons from me that this this part right here was a blank spot that I had more, which was, it wasn't laying out this, it was that I wasn't giving myself the time to do it. I would, I would knock out one or two sketches and then try to hammer home. It was like, if you went like 30% is layout, 30% is drawing it, 30% is adding the detail. I would go like 5% layout, 75% was drawing the shit out of things and trying to make it work at the wrong stage and then the, the finish or I don't know but you get what I'm saying is like like I was completely unbalanced with the preparatory work to actually do a piece so you live and you learn but I there was it was a huge problem for me um literally as he says figure I now, figure I is more like it. We've got the Hulk coming right at us, tearing up the pavement. A dodging daredevil is also coming towards us. Squeezed between the Hulk and the camera. Stuck between a rock and a hard place, so to speak. So close that he can smell the broccoli Hulk had for lunch on the green guy's breath. Uh, in the more detailed layout, figure J, uh, I rotated the Hulk a bit to put more punch in his punch and added the flying debris around Daredevil behind the Hulk. You can see lines indicating where I put, where I plan to put some uh, building to establish the city. 
So this was brilliant, and I'm going to explain why. Not only do I think that this was the best splash page, remember, this is an opening splash. This isn't just a splash. This feels like the opening of a comic book to me. Like, we, you, you flip it open, and you feel like you're right in the middle of a fight scene. And you want to turn the page and see how this goes. It's not a finite moment, meaning that, that you know, you get this, like, oh, yeah, they're fighting. Cool. Like, you know, you've seen it a million times. This really does propel me um, into the story. I'm not 100% sure, psychologically speaking. What do you guys think? What makes this the best? Because I totally agree with him. There was one one of these wizard ones that we did. I won't... I mean, I, it doesn't really matter the artist's name, but uh, it was a layout, like laying a page out. I didn't think his layout was very good. And in fact, I thought he made um, not only some bad calls, but ultimately the execution of the final page had problems with composition the way that they spotted the blacks the perspective drifted there was a lot of issues that i had with it they're a very good penciler though but the, the 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 example that they used was not good this is great and i totally agree with it but i'm not 100 percent sure why does this feel like a page turner more what do you see i mean this is really good i don't it's i think it's the you know what it is it's the closest of it and we don't i'm not seeing everything literally which makes me want to see more this this that's it that is what it is i just figured it out this we see all of hulk we see his hand we see his other hand i mean it's covered up by this panel but we nearly see all of hulk and we nearly see all of daredevil i don't need to see more i already know what's going on here this is a fight we see the characters i see both of their hands and their feet it's interesting but it's it doesn't create any mystery to me I don't need to know more about this. This is part of the Hulk is covered up. We don't kind of see all of Daredevil. We see enough of them. And I think that this forces you to want to see more. What do you think? Is that it? All right. So this is part of what we do on Patreon. But there's literally uh, any part of drawing, composing, illustration, books. We cover it all. I try to keep it varied so that people stay engaged. The one thing that I notice is if you do four videos of the same thing, whether it's something that people really want to learn, the views go lower and lower and lower. So we have to mix it up. And this is a good way to do it. This is important stuff to understand and part of the psychology of drawing that I talk about. All right. Have a great day. Come check out Patreon last month for $1 and uh, you will love it. I promise you, you'll learn a ton. All right. Later.